Welcome to Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert, a podcast sponsored by the Healing Lives Center. Discover how to love and lead your family well and biblically. God created sex, marriage, and the family for our stewardship, growth, and benefit. My heart and passion is to teach, train, educate, and disciple Christians that want strong marriages and families. The Healing Life Center has been serving Christians since the year 2000. Its mission is to be a center for sex, trauma, and marriage education and transformation, where we offer counseling, coaching, courses, and speaking services to you, your church, or ministry. Check us out at HealingLives.com. Welcome, welcome. Today I have an amazing conversation that I'm looking forward to because it's such a really, really important topic with Carrie Bach. Thank you so much for being on with me. Thanks for having me. Yes, you have a, a, a focus that's so needed for us to talk about and one that as Christians, we often um, ignore completely. It flies under the radar or we actually act like it's something that's not something we can talk about. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation and kind of your expertise so tell us about you and kind of how you got into this and your focus on um, OCD and anxiety. Sure. I am a licensed professional counselor in Tennessee. I have a bit of a hybrid practice. I am mostly online seeing clients throughout Tennessee, but then I also do in-person, in-person intensive sessions for right. clients who are looking to do some very specific um, trauma-based work. Nice. And to go through and clear things out in a shorter amount of time rather than having to open it up and close it back down over and over and over again, uh, week by week. Yeah. So for those clients who are looking to, for example, even overcome a phobia, we can kind of desensitize them um, in that day process instead of having to take a long time to get through it. So I like to say, um, you know, I'll move as fast or as slow as you want me to, mm-hmm. just kind of depending on what you're wanting. But awesome. I also have a podcast called Hope for Anxiety and OCD that I started a couple years ago. And it's a welcome place for struggling Christians to reduce shame, increase hope and develop healthier connections with God and others. Nice. That's so, so good. It's neat that you do things that way because I don't meet very, very many counselors who are doing what you're doing. Uh, I do the same thing. I do intensives. I don't do 50 minute sessions once a week for the eternity. <laughs> it's yeah. get in there. Let's actually really do some hard work um, and see change actually very quickly, which is, is really important, especially with OCD and anxiety. Uh, those can yeah. drag on if we're not, if not treated well. Right. And I find that in our society, people do want to get better faster and they often don't think that that's an option or don't realize that that's an option because they've been kind of sold just a typical 50 minute therapeutic hour. And not to say that that's not helpful because it certainly helped a lot of people. But like you said, with some people, it takes them a little while to get into the work. And so Next thing you know, you know, you're about 30 minutes in and then they're they're ready and then you've only got about 20 minutes left. So uh, that can kind of hamper getting much done on, on the week to week basis. Well, even two hours in sometimes. Like I do four to six hour sessions and I can be two or three hours in and it's like we really haven't. I know there's more here. We, we've gotten some, but. So to have stopped and start again, you kind of have to start all over. And so that's been, I've loved seeing what happens in hours three and four and even five sometimes personally. Um, yeah. That yeah. model is one that's, I think it's more about the patient versus about, uh, sad to say, even just the counselor having a, a weekly revenue. <laughs> that's kind of the mm-hmm. model, if you will. Um, but your heart is really Christians where... This is an area that we don't talk about enough. Um, OCD specifically, I don't hear much talked about. Anxiety is almost a badge of honor now and and sad to say, but still not treated well. And OCD is talked about. So what have you learned and what have you heard from clients? What's been your experience that's helped you even (laughs) dig deeper? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the reasons I started my podcast in the first place, because I wanted to see who is speaking into the mental health space for Christians and not just like, a, OK, I have anxiety because there are, are tons of probably books and 
um, seminars and different things for Christians, specifically with anxiety, right? And devotional books. I mean, probably overload. You could find several, maybe even might be able to find a workbook. But when you start to look into OCD, what you're going to find is you're going to find some personal stories, but not really much in terms of like clinical help. So I wanted to find this mixture of like, okay, how can we take all of Jesus, all of the Bible, all of the good, really good, <laughs> juicy Christian stuff, and also combine it with um, all of the really good clinical mental health stuff so that we're not just giving people like sometimes in the Christian space we're giving them like I said the devotional it's like um, mental health light (laughs) versus like that's going to help a lot of people with generalized anxiety but doesn't necessarily help somebody who's struggling with a, a clinical anxiety disorder or especially not for OCD because what happens is someone with OCD goes and tries to apply common scriptures to their life you know let me pray and find peace let me try to take every thought captive mm-hmm. make it obedient to Christ and then they're like I can't do this they yeah. end up with a lot of shame I do. and what I've found is that talking to Christians in my practice they were like I was like, who knows about this? Have you told your pastor? Have you talked with someone at your church? And they just look at me almost in horror, like, no, like, I can't talk about that. What do you what do you mean? I mean, people are going to think I'm crazy if I tell them that I'm having these types of thought processes. And I think that that's really sad because the church is designed to be a hospital for sick people. And so if we can't be okay, you know, we're really good if someone has cancer. But somehow when someone has OCD, then we just like look like deer in the headlights and we have no idea what to do. So I, I want to kind of change that conversation yeah. um, and also create resources, create encouragement, create support for my clients who were struggling to know you're not alone. We have a lot of um, personal stories on the podcast where people will talk about their anxiety or their OCD, you know, and and talk about how they've gotten help, talk about, um, you know, how they've kind of come out of the shame piece from it, how they've recognized like, oh, maybe it is okay if I take medication versus it being this bad thing that people do. Um, I've even heard people say in the church, like, um, you know, you can't take mental health medications. It's not um, shined upon in certain circles. So it just really depends on where you're coming from. Obviously, there are some people that are very open to it, but then there are some people who are not, just depending on the you know, on the circle and the the circumstance and denomination, maybe. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing a story of a pastor who, or he's a professor, but he was uh, guest speaking at a church and how he shared in front of this large congregation, a a mega church about his own struggle for anxiety with anxiety. When he got off stage, the deacons met him at the uh, down there and said, you will never speak here again. How dare you show vulnerability and show that you're not basically perfect. And he's never been invited to come back to that church again, which what's cool is he's now written books on this and he's actually gotten like, (laughs) it's sad how there's still this stigma. And what's annoying to me is that even the word mental health, everyone has a mental health. Yes. yes, It's very true. They have Mm -hmm. a mental health. I don't know. You might be okay. And (laughs) they're struggling, but you'll probably realize you actually have one too, that you're stewarding. And there's some areas you can grow in, in terms of your mental health. So it's like, we need to kind of normalize. It's it's almost like we're we're normalizing just dysfunction. Like I joke to my college students that they tend to get their medical advice from TikTok and you know, <laughs> YouTubers. That's scary. It is. And the sad thing is that's what's happening for adolescents. Oftentimes they're going to hear, listen to their peers hands down over medical or a doctor or a counselor. So to have someone that's speaking in from a biblical Christian worldview, but with practical, tangible, doable skills. So go back to OCD. If I tell us someone with OCD here, read your Bible here, do this. Don't they take it to the nth degree of, I don't do it the way I do. It's got to be perfect. 
which means yeah i mean sometimes they can get really stuck up on like certain scripture passages especially yeah. with you know there's different subtypes of ocd so especially with scrupulosity which is like the religious subtype mm -hmm. where you know they christians will get stuck on like can i lose my salvation or am i going to hell or have i committed the unpardonable sin um and really like ruminate these things over and over and a lot of times our pastors also are not trained that this is a sign of ocd so they're like okay john is just really having a hard time feeling secure in his understanding that he really is saved and he really is a christian and we need to like come around him and maybe this is spiritual warfare and maybe that you know john the devil may be trying to tell you that you know you're not saved and you need to pray and and so if people aren't picking up on what this looks yeah. like then we aren't going to be able to help people so that that's another piece too is just the education of it all is is so huge for, even for our pastors and lay people to kind of know hey these are some signs and symptoms that somebody may be struggling a little bit more than just hey they have a lot of questions about their faith because you know we all knew that that one kid in youth group maybe that always had their hand raised and i don't know maybe that was me sometimes who knows but <laughs> you know or you you always have a question about something or they're like what about this or you know what about the people before jesus and all all of these types of things but ocd um, people who are struggling with that can really get stuck on those things causing a high level of fear and distress right um even though and even some of the language that we use in church sometimes like do you know that you know that you know you yeah. know do you have complete assurance you know that you're saved like those no. are really not good things <laughs> for yeah. people who are dealing with ocd it's like uh you know um so then really how, do, how do you get them. the diagnosis of ocd so like what would that be someone in church joe you know sarah mm -hmm. different people um they're going to go to their doctor oftentimes if that's usually where we go is maybe even general practitioner like where did that, that diagnosis come from because a lot of people self-diagnose and that's a whole different story uh, sure where does the diagnosis come from and what are they actually what is it exactly for those that are listening like what yeah, I mean, it, it takes um, a person with OCD an average of seven years to get diagnosed, which is a really sad story because that's a really long time to be dealing with something and not knowing what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So typically what will happen is someone will come to um, a counselor or a doctor and say, I'm anxious. And then that individual will start treating them like they're anxious unless they're trained to kind of dive in and add a little bit more questions. So when I am talking to somebody and I think they might be dealing with OCD, I will always ask them, do you seek out reassurance from other people? Like, are you asking them questions to kind of reassure yourself? Because that's a very common OCD characteristic. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I'll ask them is, you know, how much time are you spending on Google or researching things? And right. so they'll tell me stories about, well, I found my bump, this bump on my leg, and then I was on Google for two hours or YouTube. I was watching these videos trying to figure out, you know, do I have some kind of disease or rash or what's going okay. on? So this, I, you know, the idea is there's these obsessions that people get stuck on, you know, could be, you know, what if this bump of my leg is, is some kind of disease? That would be like right. more of a somatic obsession. They can get stuck on sexual obsessions, harm obsessions, relationship obsessions. There's all different kinds of obsessions. So it's not just germs and cleanliness. That's really what I want to get out there and educate people right. about. Because a lot of times people think, oh, it's like Monk, you know, on TV. He has to, <laughs> you know, he can't touch the door handle. He has to use a handkerchief or he's got to have things lined up just so in his in his house and OCD can look like that, but it more commonly takes a wide range of, um, of obsessions. And then the compulsions, another reason it's not diagnosed or not picked up on right away is many of the compulsions can be internal. So we often think of the person that, you know, checks the door lock three times, that would be like checking or redoing a behavior. That certainly is a compulsion. Washing hands is a compulsion that people are familiar with, but they're not as familiar with people repeating certain prayers in their head. So maybe if someone thinks like um, if they have a violent intrusion, they may say a certain prayer or feel like they have to confess over and over again. And that the engaging in the obsessions and the compulsions like, 
it provides a temporary level of relief when someone engages in a compulsion. It's a little bit of a exhale, like just for a moment, but Dopamine then hit. the the fear comes back and it's the what if comes back and the questioning and the the doubt. You know, it's it's called the doubter's disease sometimes. So that will creep back in and it people get caught in that loop is what I call it. The obsession compulsion loop. Yeah. How do how does you how do you think this kind of ties into these suckers, smartphones now, social media? Like I feel like oh, this kind of man. ratcheted up the level of probably more common than ever before what's going on with the obsessions and compulsions when it comes to now the relationship we have with these devices. Well, absolutely, because if you think about research, if you or I wanted to research 20 years ago, we'd, you know, drive ourselves to a library, we'd be looking up encyclopedias, we'd be, yep. you know, we had the internet, but it was super slow, you know, yep. those types of things. And now we can just be in our living rooms and pull out a smartphone and we can have a wealth of information, a ton and really go down, you can go down a Google or YouTube rabbit hole for hours because I've certainly had clients tell me about it, you know, um, clients who looked up apologetics videos for two, three hours um, because they were trying to prove some tenant of the faith that they were worried about or doubting. Well, that's like a badge of um, honor there too. It's like, why would that be diagnosable? I'm researching right. something good or I'm researching even a, like you said, a bump on my leg, I'm researching that. That sounds like good stewardship. No, again, this is getting misdiagnosed, if not completely missed, because there's a right. problem here that is actually treatable, that you're really yeah. not okay. And it's highly distressing internally, and people are trying to relieve that distress, but in the process of trying to relieve that distress, they're just creating more distress. And that's just what's really like painful and hard about this condition is it, it's it's almost like getting stuck in quicksand, you know, the, the more that you're in it, you just sink further and further down. I have, I have a bit of a potato chip analogy with OCD. I like to say that, you know, if OCD had a saying, it would be like the potato chip commercial where you can't eat just one, you know, so that initial uh -huh. um, compulsion or the initial obsession starts in and you think, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just do this compulsion and then I'll feel a little bit better. But then it's like, oh, that desire just keeps going. And next thing you know, you're on the couch and you have a half eaten bag of potato chips and you're feeling terrible. And you feel then you the shame sets in of like, oh, man, like I just ate a whole half a bag of potato chips or, you know, for that person with OCD, man, I've just been on Google for three hours and I needed to fold my laundry and, you know, do some clean my house and I haven't, or I need to write a paper for school. I've just sat here. Which again, I think it's probably more because of smartphones, because of social media, it's more normal and normalized, which when I think of college students, when I think of just people around everywhere you're on your phone you're distracted you're searching you're asking questions we're losing actual relationships we're losing a lot of the the meat of life when we're always doing that but we all, actually all, almost don't see it as bad it's become so right normal, which so mm -hmm. you mentioned distress so that's actually the key word when it comes to diagnosis is when it's causing me distress a lot of people don't realize that what they're doing is causing them distress, do they? And if it's not causing them distress, I mean, you just mentioned the relationship piece. It's causing someone in their family yeah. distress. It's yeah. causing their spouse distress because they're saying, no, I have to go immediately hop in the shower because I just touched something that I believe was contaminated. Um, you know, I have to you know, do this type of ritual when I get home or when I leave the house. Sometimes it can, if they have checking rituals, it could take them 30 minutes to leave the house because I need to make sure that the oven is off and I need to make sure that the curling iron's not on because the house could burn down and unplug the TV. I mean, if you just think about the different appliances and things that you could go check and unplug, you could be in your house for 30 minutes to an hour and then all of a sudden it's affecting my work because I'm I'm late on a habitual basis or it's affecting my spouse because they feel like, okay, 
we can't ever, you know, go anywhere. It's really hard for you to leave. You have to check all these things or, you know, children, children are messy. They're sticky. They're all kinds of things. So obviously that can be pretty distressful if someone has some type of um, mm -hmm. contamination, OCD. And then uh, because OCD gets attached to things that people really care about, if they do have children, they may have obsessions about their children about accidentally harming their children or that their children are going to get harmed in some way if they don't engage in these compulsive behaviors. So it really is a Tied disorder together. that definitely affects other family members. Yeah. So then if a person were to reach out to you and the people you work with, um, what is, I guess, show me a typical session um, uh, intensive. What's the focus? What Outline. Do? What, what does that look like? Because again, a lot of people, what they're yeah. doing also, they're, they're afraid to go to a counselor because of their own perception or movies of what it is, um, not reality. And a person can actually. I'm just help. learning from from TV shows that um, uh, counselors on TV are incredibly unethical. I don't know if you've ever noticed it's about horrible. that. They have they have dual relationships all over the place, but that's another story. Well, even like so, teachers, the amount of teachers portrayed on. I'm a, a professor. It's like. That are sleeping with their uh, students yes. or marrying their students. And it's like, this is all of it's messed up. Yet that's teaching our younger generation. This is normal. And that's same for when right. we were younger too. Grew up on friends and other TV shows. You're shaped negatively as well. But um, yeah, yeah so I, session, for we'll me, I, I provide a lot of education about right. OCD. And if they're a Christian, you know, that intersection, obviously, like, this is how it's, you know, affecting your your faith, it looks yeah. like, and really helping people learn to sit with uh, doubt and uncertainty, which we all have at some point in our life, because I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow in my own life. I, I can tell you what I have planned for tomorrow, but that doesn't mean that it's going yeah. to occur, especially not the way mm -hmm. I've planned it. So really learning to kind of sit with some of that ambiguity, even in terms of faith, you know, there are things that we can have confidence in based on the Bible, but it does take faith. Like our, our faith takes faith, if that makes sense. And so that means believing in something that we can't see. And we're not going to have all the answers and we're not going to be perfect. So being able to sit with the that discomfort of the uncertainty for people with OCD is very hard. Um, I use a lot of mindfulness with my clients. And so the education piece is important. The mindfulness piece is important. Understanding the difference between a thought and a desire is really huge right. for someone with OCD. So mm -hmm. if they think, if I have this thought that I'm going to harm my children, yeah. that means I want to harm my children. Right. Those are two completely different things that they have to learn to separate. So we can help them like become through mindfulness, becoming really good at sitting in the present it's yeah. like learning to notice, oh, I'm noticing I am having a thought about harming my children. I know this falls within my typical OCD obsessional range. And I, if you are able to learn to kind of detach from your thought process mm -hmm. instead of being sucked into it, then you can say, oh, bam, like that's an OCD thought. Uh, right. from, because I'm very trauma informed, I always look for um, any type of uh, trauma that a person's experienced that may be latching into some of their symptomology, yeah. um, hospitalizations, um, and medical trauma, um, you know, deaths in the family where they became really, really stuck and concerned on certain things. Um, a lot of those can be at the root um, of of some OCD experiences. That's not necessarily a common and popular belief that you're going to hear from a lot of people out there uh, because I, OCD I is typically treated I think you're very behaviorally. I, it, yeah. it is. I think you're, I, I'm so frustrated with the industry at times in this in service of, yes. of where we miss trauma. And that's mm -hmm. my heart and passion and work, work I do is all from the trauma lens and the amount of bipolar diagnoses that I see that are, um all of a sudden go away when they deal with the trauma it's like that's not how bipolar works it's a misdiagnosis right missing mm -hmm. the actual root and so i think you're hitting the nail on the head with the trauma piece it's not always but 
right have that lens um, but you've mentioned education which is so critical you're helping teach them about something that allows them to then be more informed in their daily life but when they're not with you of what yeah. their processes are like and what their thinking's like and like you said thought versus desire um, and then mindfulness provides tools which those two things alone are invaluable like mm-hmm. those, that, that's that's yeah. huge they haven't, we haven't even huge. gotten into them sharing their story or um because that's even oftentimes not as necessary as i think education and the tools which, yeah and just really getting to something that another ocd therapist told me is they said you know ocd is traumatic in itself and i i had never really thought about it that way it's mm-hmm. not a like life or death trauma but if you're thinking about being an eight-year-old child and internally all you hear is you've done something bad you have to go tell your mom now you have to confess and you go to your mom and you confess and your mom's like okay all right honey go back to bed you know or whatever it is and then like that pattern gets repeated and at some point or another mom's like what is going on here you know with this child like and and a lot of times the parents you know it's not been on their radar now that's changing as time goes on and we know more and more about mental health and in children and teenagers but a lot of the clients that i'm seeing as adults their their parents had no idea that they were dealing with ocd um when they were younger and so it it caused some you know rifts in the family or it caused some high levels of internal distress for the kids so sometimes what we do is we go back and process that like process that experience where you were really worked up and you felt out of control Um, a lot of times it has to do with feelings of um, times that they were out of control or times that they tried to be in control but couldn't um, as a child when part of what I even hear you say is, so we're going to have education, we're going to teach some tools, but we're going to go back into some of the stories and almost in a sense, look at them from a different angle. Because of what we've yeah. taught and because we have skills now, we can look back and go, oh, mom, I have grace now. Mom and dad didn't understand that they still really loved me. Wow. I never, I had yeah. I lost that love part because of my focusing on the fact that they missed me or they they missed what was going on they didn't see me as you're helping them reframe yeah. um their story the stories is still the same like can't change the right. past but all of a sudden i feel different today because of again the processing mindfulness t- uh, skills and then education um and yeah I, I use a lot of right. I use a lot of um, ego state work, which is parts work integrated into, you know, trauma therapy that I use. Yes. Yeah. It's so it's it's really great. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. To have like the adult, like very resource part of self be able to tell that child, like you have OCD, it's a condition, you're not crazy. It's not your fault and you're going to be okay like in because that was the piece that was missing for them that they didn't get and so being able to provide it in the present it sounds hokey and weird sometimes to people who've never done it before but it's so therapeutic and healing in the right context of processing trauma it just really relieves a lot for people and if you're listening to this i mean it's internal family systems is one of the most to me one of those powerful tools Um, There are some really, really good resources um, from Richard Schwartz and others that have been written about internal family systems. And that's what the parts conversation kind of is. And um, that's, again, another one of those education pieces that when you start giving them vocabulary, the phrase I pretty much use is, all of a sudden I see that I'm not crazy. You know, that's the clinical term for most of it. I'm crazy. What's wrong with me? No, you're actually struggling and oftentimes it's you're fighting yourself because yeah it's okay to think Huge. that but what do i do with it it's okay to feel that but what do i do with it it's normal to think that or feel that or wow this is really abnormal okay now what do i do with that that's where it gets into a little more messier um, and where ocd isn't just the uh, hand washing and checking and it's actually much broader, which I'm glad we're having this conversation. And you mentioned even anxiety. Yeah. Too. It's tied to these things, which they're all kind of interconnected. 
and we're yeah, and we almost like split them up, which isn't necessarily always good. That's true. And I really try to look at, you know, what is the person bringing in? What's their symptomology more so than just like trying to slap some kind of uh, label on them? You know, what's what are the symptoms and what's really driving that? What's behind that um, behavior that you're engaging in? Um, what's what's interesting, too, a lot of times is people are fearing fear, if that makes sense. If you yep. look at someone that's having panic attacks, it's yep. like, OK, now I don't want to leave the house because I'm afraid I'm I'm fearing that I'm going to have this reaction that I've had in the past yeah. uh, before. So it, so it's like a it's a fear of, of being afraid. And then that just ramps up yep. the anxiety even more. That's versus being able to say, OK, with anger, like what we learn in church oftentimes is when I'm angry, what do I do? I get angry at my anger. I'm like, <laughs> shut it down. <laughs> that's now I'm doubly angry. Really? That's not the smart path to go versus stop, pause. Why am I angry? Talk to it, which sounds weird. And it's like, wow, I'm angry because someone pulled in front of me. OK, oh, my gosh, get over yourself. Like you can't control the drivers around you. Like you're angry and versus I'm angry because there was an injustice or I'm angry because I got passed over for a promotion. Okay. That's a very valid, you know, angst, but what are you going to do with it? I can process that with OCD. It's like all those networks are missing connections or missing uh, permissions to be able to, to communicate and to allow for a healthy processing, which you're basically saying you help offer and teach education and skills to then have those conversations in my head, which we all do to then yeah. function better in this world, still having OCD potentially, but now I'm managing. Right. And, and ultimately you're wanting to help people get out of that loop is the, the exactly. long story short. So you, you get towards, you know, the end and you're saying, okay, can you have that obsession? Can you notice it without engaging in the compulsion? Nice. Can you notice how uncomfortable that might feel to do that? And then you can have people practice, which is more of a typical say exposure response prevention is what you hear of a lot of times with OCD. And I just want to say for anybody listening, that's not the only therapy out there for <laughs> OCD. There are people using acceptance and commitment therapy. There are people using mindfulness based interventions and trauma based therapies for OCD. So right. um, I get very frustrated, like you said, when the clinicians are as rigid as those people that they are trying to treat. I don't find that to be very helpful at all. <laughs> amen. 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 Love it. So yeah. I know people are all going to go at a different pace. Um, have you seen people come to you and within one session, their life is really a different, different experience? In just one second? Um, as, as far as like from doing the intensives mm -hmm. or yeah, just in general, intensives. like a 50 minute no, intensive. sessions? Intensives. Yeah. Well, probably the um, person I'm thinking of most recently, I did have someone that had a phobia and for a long, long time had this phobia. And she was able to get uh, cleared of that in two um, nice. one day intensive sessions. And it was just very interesting. I mean, the stuff that it went back to when we were really trying to just kind of follow her body and, mm -hmm. you know, see like where things were coming from. I mean, I'm sure she was probably surprised by some of the memories nice. that came up connected to this phobia. Like, oh, really? That's that's where some of that stuff came from nice. and was able to process through and clear it. And then with EMDR, we can do basically what's called a future template where we kind of have you imagine we did more of an imaginal exposure for mm -hmm. her because we couldn't do a um you know live exposure with what she was um, afraid of so we did an imaginal one and she was able to get through that and really well and was like okay i, I think i i feel like i can do this and that was just pretty amazing i was like wow that's incredible that's so like, why i love it like it would have taken probably that's why I, I try to explain to people you know you're talking about months of therapy in a day right. so it really is um a good value because it it probably would have taken months, months. of therapy Absolutely. to get that's through what I that see. I see that yeah. it takes months for most cl clinicians and um, you're able to in, in a couple of weeks, a couple of sessions, which I think is so much more um, beneficial for the client. Um, it, it, a bigger, a, It's doing no harm. It's better service on, our, on every, almost every rubric. It's actually a better right. even money on their part 
Um, I, I just think that's a, a powerful um, testimony, yeah. if you will. Obviously, some people are going to take longer. Um, it's not sure, sure. And people with complex trauma histories or, you know, very severe symptoms, you know, they're spending hours and hours on something. That's a different story. And sometimes people need, you know, um, higher level of services like intensive outpatient therapy right. um, for OCD or residential treatment, things like right. that. There are um, certainly services in place for that if, if they're feeling like, you know, it's I'm just I can't seem to get through. Uh, any kind of length of time without engaging in these compulsions. But um, I think what I've what I've seen is that um, individuals, the, the biggest piece really for people who are doing ongoing therapy is letting go of the shame piece yes. and recognizing like, okay, like it's okay to be a Christian and struggle with this. It doesn't mean I'm a bad Christian because I'm struggling. Um, I can, you know, it's okay to have a mental health disorder and that God's, God still loves me, that compassion is still there, and I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to earn that love. I mean, that's that in itself so is so critical. Powerful. That is so critical. Yeah. Absolutely. The shame piece, the amount of people that carry shame, really, I would say everyone. We That's all level, have yeah. shame, kind of like we mm -hmm. all have a mental health. And so it's more like, so how are you stewarding the things in your life that actually bring you shame, whether it's something you thought, something you did, something you're doing, past, present? I think that's a work that we need to be doing in the church period in small groups all the time. It's my personal opinion. Um, this could be yeah, something that can be done absolutely. just as part of teaching people that you're all, we are all fallen and we all have areas of struggle. Now the shame that a lot of the clients I have, a lot of them carry what's so difficult is it shame. That's not theirs to carry. I deal more with the mm. sexual abuse side Oh yeah. That's like mm -hmm. you're no, it's shame on them, not you. And so helping release that. You mentioned earlier um EMDR. So what does that stand for? Yeah. What does that mean? Uh EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a really fancy name that isn't relevant. <laughs> well, but it's a tool. that's why we just call it EMDR. Yeah. And it's a tool. It's a, yes, it's a therapeutic technique. Yes, that's um, really, really, really yeah. cool. That it, how much it works. Effective. Yeah. Very effective. Trauma. And mm -hmm. again, for those listening, research it. It's interesting. It's weird. And from what I've even seen in some of the research, it's like we don't know why it works, but we know it works. So it's kind of funny the way they kind of. And it's kind of old school is your eyes going back and forth with a finger. Um, I, mm -hmm. use, I use the TheraTappers, which just tap back and forth in your hand, like little eggs you hold. Um, yeah. But that, that tool too. allows you to almost kind of, the this is the way I conceptualize it, like put a, a path, like a path between the th thoughts and the emotions, which allows the body to mm. kind, of, kind of calm down and still deal with either the trauma or the memory, but in a less activating way. Is it, would you, how would you put it? Does that, how does that sound? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like there are new pathways essentially that form in the brain when you're doing EMDR. I mean, we have a lot of um, research on neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. just in general, which is, you know, changes in the brain happening after people have, you know, it doesn't have to be after somebody has a stroke, but after somebody has a stroke, you know, part of their brain may be damaged, but they go to therapy or they have some speech therapy and there's some rewiring actually that happens in their brain. So from right. a mental health standpoint, we're doing the same thing with, with traumatic memories. Essentially, it's moving from short-term storage of, this is the fight, flight, or freeze. I'm ex re-experiencing this right now to, uh, that was something in the past. So like, I don't exactly. have to continue to carry that out into my Love future. That. Love that. Yeah. That's such a, that's such an important tool. Yeah. And yeah, then it, it really going is. back in the past, like if you think of, you mentioned how the, I think it was the person you were talking about earlier, how they hadn't made a connection with their phobia to things in their past. I see that too, as well. It's like, they have no idea that what's the day-to-day -day battle is actually linked to something that's very tangible in their memory. And right. all, all we do is we almost like point at the memory and point these together. And all of a sudden their whole world's changed. It's not that simple, but in some ways it's like, Oh my gosh, my whole life makes more sense now. And now there's just a little bit yeah. of work 
the cleanup afterwards. Uh, to me, that's one of the most coolest pieces of our, like how simple we are in some sense, but how there is a reason why you're probably obsessing compulsing or in this space. Um, and when yeah, you yeah, I don't sense, think we just develop or grow mental health symptoms overnight. No, that just right. doesn't really reason, make sense in a lot yeah, of ways. Reason why I'm anxious. There's a reason I'm I'm living in fear, especially after the last few years mm -hmm. that we've dealt with the craziness. That it's even more so. So it's like how to understand. Yeah, this makes sense. But then now I need skills to proceed, which is what a therapist or counselor um, offers. So, right. And we, we go through periods of our life where maybe two or three things happened. I know I've had that in my own life where it's like, if you had one of those isolated things to deal with, you probably would have dealt with it better or okay. But then you pile two or three other things on top of it. And it's like yeah. almost overload now. Like my, my stress response, I can only take so much. And now I have to start unpacking uh, some of this. So that sometimes the the trauma, people think, well, you know, it wasn't really that big of a deal, but it may not have just been that. It was that, but then also there was a death in the family, maybe around the same time, or there, you know, your loved one, um, spouse, or your mother, whoever didn't respond well right. when you disclose. That yep. can cause all kinds of, you know, issues, and that's a that's a separate thing in itself. But yeah, a lot of things have affected us that mm -hmm. we don't want to think has affected us. And we have to realize, especially with things that have happened to us as children, our brains were still developing then. We didn't have the adult level of thinking about the world and the perspective that we have now. Right. So when we go back and work on those things, it's almost like we're giving that gift. We're giving that adult, right. like you said, the shift in perspective, oh. um, gift to that like child self within us that we're able to look at things differently. And then that, that just really shifts things in our brain. I, I believe that. Yeah, you know, we like to minimize kind of our story when we compare it to others. Comparison is we do it, but it's actually a very dangerous um, exercise that we engage in. And social media and things have made it even easier to compare. And it's usually comparing to a lie, but uh, or missed or half truth. But mm -hmm. we we are wired a certain way, just even as humans, but even fallen beings, people that are um, not perfect. So the grace piece of that's critical to be able to give yourself grace to you're not going to always have it all together. And um, like you said about the multiple things stacking up, it's amazing how we seem to have even culturally in the church kind of more of a buck up, suck it up mentality versus yeah. if we just sat there for just a few moments even and allowed us to go, wow, I need to grieve. And that's an area that I think we're not. That's where we're missing a lot. Ouch, that hurt. I can then proceed in a much healthier way. But instead, we often just push the people through seasons where they missed out on this piece or that piece of grief. And so resentment builds or compulsions and obsessions build or anxiety builds. So people come to whatever that diagnosis is very honestly. Um, so like what I tell my students is if you don't understand a person, you're asking, you're not asking the right questions, like get, get to know them more. Um, why get are more they information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're paid. Absolutely. To that, and, in sense. <laughs> and even yeah, and even people who come from a good Christian family, I, I like to say nobody was raised by Jesus or Mother Teresa. And so, oh. you know, our parents were imperfect and they did the best that they could with what they had. But, you know, we can say, hey, I had really good parents who tried really hard. And also in the same breath, like say, and I didn't get everything that I needed because they weren't perfect. That's and there, there were times where I. 100% of people. Yeah. That's yeah. everyone. Yeah, there were times where I really needed somebody and maybe they weren't there for me or maybe right. they didn't know how to help me. Exactly. Maybe they, they didn't know how to be with their own emotional experience so they couldn't be with my emotional experience. Well, I was talking to my 14-year-old yesterday. Um, he was He's wrestling with some stuff right now. And I was like, Blaze, I said, you, you know, we're here always and you know that. And we approach you often to check in and to push and to help provide that space for you to ask things of us or to wrestle. 
but we've also partnered with your youth pastor and your our scout leaders and our homeschool co-op friend. Like we have people in your life that are all there on purpose. We've vetted these people. We've built this on purpose to be the kind of people that come that you're able to go to um, when when you won't come to us because we know that there's times you're not going to come to us. Same for our 16 year old. It's like you're struggling with something. Go to someone, pick one of those people, but don't try to go this alone. And it's hard. I mean, don't I'm suffer I'm, in silence. I'm a yeah. shrink and I'm like, I can't fix my own kids. Well, exactly, because they are human beings with free will, with their own struggles, their own, you know, even worldviews for that matter. And so it's like how to help them um, grow up into young men that actually are trustworthy and helpful and godly and protectors and same for my daughter who's 12 it's like she's in a different space so it's like how to i my wife and i are we love each other we're a great marriage but it's like yeah we've i call my kids my three experiments (laughs) they they will have their stuff and most of it we know because we've talked about it we'll talk at the dinner table about so where where are we missing it as parents um, and they'll tell us, and that's not fun. Wow, right? that's a <laughs> that's a scary question to ask your children. <laughs> it is, but it's wanting to be saying, "Hey, none of us have this together a hundred percent, and none of us are perfect." And right. here's what I'm wrestling with. Here's where I'm struggling, or here's where I've got questions about God. And um, this is an important. The home to me is the place to have those conversations, but the second of that is the church. But it's amazing yeah, how many absolutely. homes and churches are not safe places to have hard to ask hard questions because people want you to snap back into into line. And so, no, yeah. a good a good potential future leader is one that asks really hard questions when they're younger. Yeah, they're not OK with the status Je- quo. Jesus asked some really hard questions of some oh, people. If you it. want to think about it that way, there was definitely oh. a lot of challenge, but at the same time, a balance in knowing how to sit with difficult situations and sit with people who are hurting. Yep. And, you know, sometimes, yes, he did heal people, but sometimes like they had to wait a little bit while, you know, you think about the Lazarus situation, you know, Mary and Martha's like, why didn't you show up? Why weren't you here? <laughs> you know, what happened? Well, and, and how many and other people he didn't heal? Sure. And yeah. that time on, on earth for him, it's like, what about all those other stories of the people that died or did this and that happened or the abuse going on down the street? My mind can't even wrap mm-hmm. around that. It's like, because he was actually, as a man, he could only do so much too because he was actually living as a human man with limitations. He pulled himself away and he went in, in prayer and got away from the crowds. Yeah. And how much even those in ministry, especially just go, go, go and don't take care of themselves. And how many people in counselors who are actually struggling in their marriages and bad relationships with with their kids. And it's like, no, you should be someone who have your house in order as well. And yeah, I don't see that. I see a lot of dysfunction in church ministry and in um, the helping profession. Sure, you definitely have to put on your own oxygen mask first, you know, until you yep, can yep. help someone else. I'm my daughter's really young; she's only one right now, so hey. I'm just waiting for her to to get older and be like, "Mom, why are you using that counselor stuff on me?" Like, no, <laughs> I'm not yeah. taking it. <laughs> Which my it's neat. My kids have not ever really played that card. Um, oh, that's don't. good. I don't play that. I don't work with them that way. Um, hmm. And they're each so different. Me and my middle guy, Blaze, him and I just fight. Like, we'll just go at each other because our personalities <laughs> are a little too the same. And um, my oldest shuts down and gets real hard. And so we have to f- kind of crack our way in there. And um, my daughter, Miley, is just amazing. She's 12 and she's got her whole life planned out. She's so different than the boys. And and everyone's so different. And I love that. Yeah. And your daughters, yeah. and it, God already has a plan and it has all those pieces and to, the friends that she's going to have and the hard times that he's going to even allow. And it's like, my, again, how does our brain wrap around that God has all that in his hands? Otherwise, yeah. if you don't think that way, we do want to control everything and we want to wrap them in bubble wrap and um, nope. 
They need to scrape their yeah, knees. Yeah, that doesn't to, work. <laughs> they need to fall. Yep, yep. Well, this has been such a helpful conversation. Such a good, so good to meet you and talk with you. And I love what you're doing. Um, your Thank podcast you. is Hope for Anxiety and OCD. Website is hope for anxiety and OCD.com. Um, just as it's as it sounds. Yes. Go to your website and there's re- free resources, um, book an appointment, um, and even um, it looks like a blog. So multiple things there for you to to kind of dive into. And, Lots of interaction. Yeah, you can uh, contact uh, us there. You can listen to our episodes. You can get a free audio download. Lots of good nice. resources. And I'm also creating a course um, in the process nice. of creating that for Christians with OCD who are who are struggling to provide some of those pieces that we talked about today, the education piece, the so mindfulness. Important. I and, love that you're doing that. Yeah. So important. I will yeah, definitely it, tapping into that for my clients and giving getting them to you as well just so they can awesome. have you as a resource that's so important as christians yeah, to me, we should lead the way when it comes to mental health actually overall health marriage health family health uh, we should lead the way so i love what you're doing i love that you're speaking life into a world that is hurting so thank you so much for for being on the show and for talking with me Yeah, thank you for allowing me to talk about OCD in the Christian context. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert podcast. It has been an honor to serve. If you are struggling, have questions, or in need, Dr. Gilbert offers a free consultation for new clients. Check us out at HealingLives.com to book a call. If this has been helpful to you, please share it, leave a review, and help us get the word out so that we can see lives changed, marriages transformed, and more people come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The Healing Life Center offers online courses, programs, books, intensives, and other services to help you live biblically and well. Discover more resources on YouTube and in Dr. Gilbert's Healing Marriage Facebook group, The Healing Marriage.